Welcome to Philosophical Conversations. I'm Sarah Jane Leslie. It's common knowledge that in order to conduct their research, scientists need access to laboratories, equipment, and other such resources. What though does a philosopher require? A long-standing trope has it that a philosopher needs only one thing, an armchair, preferably, of course, a comfortable one. The idea here is that while a scientist collects and analyzes data, thereby looking out at the world, a philosopher is able to conduct her research in isolation from such empirical input, thus allowing her research to be done from that proverbial armchair. According to a dominant understanding of philosophy, this is possible because philosophical methodology characteristically involves what's known as conceptual analysis. As an illustration, consider the concept knowledge. What does it take for an individual to count as knowing something? Let's consider a simple, mundane example. Suppose that John believes it is currently 5 p.m. And let us further suppose that John's belief is true. It is indeed 5 p.m. Let us also suppose that John arrived at this belief, as most of us do, by consulting a clock which he believes to be accurate. John's belief is thus both true and also justified, given how he formed it. If the story ends here, one would naturally suppose that John knows it is 5 p.m. He has a justified true belief to this effect. Indeed, this conceptual analysis of knowledge as justified true belief has a venerable history in philosophy, dating back perhaps to Plato's Theaetetus. Suppose, however, that we amend our story. Suppose that, though John believes the clock to be accurate, in fact, the clock has stopped working. However, by a lucky accident, it stopped working exactly 24 hours before, and so at the moment John consults it, it displays the actual time, 5 p.m. Let us then consider the question, does John know it is 5 p.m. in this scenario? Even though his belief is true and justified, it seems to fall short of counting as knowledge. These cases are known as Gettier cases after philosopher Edmund Gettier, who presented them in the 1960s. They present challenges to the analysis of knowledge as justified true belief. Taking a step back, though, we might note that I did not cite any experimental data here. Rather, I urged us to reflect on a case or on a thought experiment, and I used our reactions to the case to provide evidence against a particular analysis. This is paradigmatically the sort of research that can be done from an armchair. Recently, however, this armchair methodology has been challenged by a growing movement known as experimental philosophy. And indeed, the unofficial logo of the movement is the image of a burning armchair. We have with us today one of the founding members of the movement, Dr. Joshua Nob, Professor of Cognitive Science and Philosophy at Yale University. Professor Nob has authored more than 60 articles in philosophy and psychology and has edited two volumes. His work has received considerable media attention, including from outlets such as the New York Times, the BBC, Scientific American, and Slate magazine. So how would you characterize experimental philosophy? What's one of its characteristic features? Well, in essence, experimental philosophy is this new movement that started maybe around 10 years or so ago. And what it emphasizes is the idea of philosophers doing experiments, and in particular doing experiments about how people ordinarily think and feel about certain kinds of philosophical questions. So to take the example that I mentioned in the introduction, that of the Gettier cases, so would an example of how experimental philosophy might proceed be to not just rely on a philosopher's reaction to that case, but to actually see if people do indeed withhold the attribution of knowledge in exactly. that case? That's a perfect kind of case. 
So suppose we want to know what is the ordinary notion of knowledge. One thing we could do is we could describe a certain kind of case, like the way you did, and then say, in this case, surely people would say blah, blah, blah. But another thing we can do is to actually go out and ask people and find out what they really do say in those kind of cases. When you do that, you find really kind of surprising results, for example, even in that exact case. So what would those results be? Well, among other things, for example, if you ask people about the Gettier case from different demographic backgrounds, say people who are uh, Americans of European descent or people who are Asian Americans, you find that they give different re responses in that kind of case. So mm -hmm. Americans of European descent, in the case that you described, Weinberg, Nichols, and Stitch showed tend to say the person doesn't have knowledge, but people of Asian descent tend to say that the person does have knowledge. Mm -hmm. Or to take a really different kind of case, um, or a series of studies by Wesley Buckhalter and James Beebe showed, if you take that exact kind of case that you described, but you just make the person be doing something morally bad, say they want to know the time for some morally bad reason, then suddenly people will say that they do have knowledge. But if you make it morally good, they'll say that they don't have knowledge. So as we begin doing experiments with these cases, we can learn more and more about what people are actually thinking about this, how people really do understand the notion of what it is to know something as opposed to, say, just believing it. So one might think that an aim in philosophy as opposed to in psychology is not necessarily to understand how people, say, employ the concept in question, but rather to figure out what the concept actually refers to or how the concept is to be analyzed. What's the correct way to understand the concept? You know, it's true that many people these days do have that very restrictive kind of view about what philosophy is all about, the exact one that you just elaborated. But I think that that's actually a relatively recent approach to philosophy, one that we see especially arising in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. The reason that I went into philosophy in the first place, though, is that I was inspired by this much earlier kind of tradition in philosophy, say, by the works of Nietzsche, by Spinoza, Karl Marx, Aristotle, Plato, and these people weren't especially interested in the kind of question that you just described. They were interested in a very different question. They wanted to understand human beings, what human beings are like, what kind of emotions we have, how we feel about the world, why we have the religious beliefs that we do. If you open up, for example, Locke's most famous work, the first thing you encounter, the first thing that he starts writing about is the question that we just posed, the question about cross-cultural diversity. So he asks, to what degree are our understanding, for example, about morality innate? And then he says, well, the key way of answering that question is, do human beings have the same moral views all over the place? Or do they have some, certain moral views around here and others, for example, in Asia? So I think you can see experimental philosophy as an attempt to just go back to traditional philosophy, the kind of philosophy that we see in the 19th century and all the way back, say, for, to the ancient period. And to sort of push against a kind of more reasoned approach to philosophy that has a much more restrictive kind of conception of what philosophy is all about. Now, one view of the long history of philosophy has it that philosophy is really the mother of all sciences. If we look back at Aristotle's work, he was concerned with biological phenomena, physical phenomena, psychological phenomena. But now we would consider those investigations to be the proper domain of biology, physics, psychology, and thereby no longer to fall under the umbrella of philosophy. And so one thought might be that historically speaking, these were appropriate questions for philosophers to engage with. But since the advent of empirical psychology, they're just no longer part of our discipline. It's spun off from us in the same way that a much longer period of time ago, physics spun off from us. Right, I think that that is a very reasonable view and one worth considering. So suppose that we wanted to ask the question about whether we should still be investigating biological phenomena in the same way that, say, Aristotle did. So Aristotle would go along the sea, look at the sea creatures, develop certain ideas about them, and then suppose someone disagreed with the idea that philosophers should stop doing that. Someone with a PhD in philosophy could start going along the beach, looking at sea creatures, philosophizing about them. We could see how well that goes. And my guess is that in that case, you'd be exactly right. That the best path would be to just leave that to the marine biologists, not to have philosophers sort of dirtying their hands with it. So now a similar kind of question could arise about this distinction that we see between the department of philosophy and the department of psychology. So one view you could have is that the best thing to do would be philosophers to not, should not muddy their hands with statistical issues, not do experiments. They should just leave that to the psychologists 
And the philosophers should just, as it were, philosophize about whatever comes out of this empirical research. And then another view would be, maybe philosophers should kind of leave their armchairs, go out and actually run some experiments. And the best way to know which of those two views is right is to just give it a try. So over these past you know, 10 years or so, philosophers have been getting out of their armchairs. They have been running all these experiments. And the best way to know whether that was a good idea is just to look at what they've come up with, see whether it turned out to be valuable. Do you believe in a distinction between experimental philosophy and experimental psychology? You know, you might think with this name experimental philosophy that there's some emphasis on the idea that there really is some really important distinction, that the idea is we should make a big deal about the distinction between psychology and philosophy, and experimental philosophy is specifically philosophy. It has some essentially philosophical character. But I feel like the experimental philosophy movement should really be understood in exactly the opposite way. It's a, really a rebellion against the idea that we should be making such a big deal about this distinction. But there are certain questions these are certain questions that have been sort of very traditionally associated with philosophy, and we should just go after those questions with every method that we can. If we start wasting our time thinking about the distinction between different disciplines and carefully deciding whether a given question falls in one discipline or another, then we're just getting in the way of a proper attempt to just figure out what the right answer to these questions is. But now, one might respond to that by saying that 15 years ago there was no experimental philosophy, but there was cognitive science, which was always understood as an interdisciplinary undertaking, including not just philosophers and psychologists, but linguists, computer scientists, so on and so forth. Uh, so why does this run under the heading of a new movement? Why give it a different name if it's not to be understood as distinct from this pre-existing thing? Well, certainly, experimental philosophy continues in that tradition. It's very much part of the cognitive science tradition that you're talking about. But I think in some sense you can see it as departing from that tradition. And the m most major departure is just this ever greater tendency for philosophers to actually be running experiments themselves, to actually be conducting experiments and reporting experimental results in philosophical texts. So there seems to be an important difference between philosophers thinking deeply and philosophizing about experimental results that are coming out of the sciences and philosophers in their philosophical texts actually reporting their own experiments. Now, some people think of the distinction in the way that I will describe, and you can say whether or not you would agree with that characterization. So just setting aside the experimental component, philosophers are very often interested in the contents of our judgments. So if we're interested, for example, uh, in considering a particular thought experiment, we might not conclude from that, that I have this particular reaction, but rather we might just conclude that reaction to be fact. So for example, when philosophers say consider trolley problems, is it permissible to flip a switch in a particular case? The data point, as it were, is not that I believe that it's permissible to flip the switch, but rather it is permissible to flip this switch. And so one way of understanding experimental philosophy is that it keeps with that same tradition, but instead of focusing on the judgments of the few, it focuses on the judgments of the many, but the interest is still in the content of the judgment. And in contrast, psychologists have never really been interested in, say, the question of whether it's actually, say, permissible to do a certain action from the moral point of view, but rather interested in the cognitive mechanisms that produce those judgments. So it's going behind the scenes, as it were. So one way of characterizing experimental philosophy from this perspective is that it's continuous with this larger philosophical tradition, whereby we're interested in the contents of people's judgments and not in the mechanisms that produce them. Is this a characterization that you'd be comfortable with? Well, clearly the main thing that experimental philosophers do is to try to understand the mechanisms underlying people's judgments. So if when experimental philosophers are just out doing their day-to-day -day work, the thing they're trying to do isn't to understand whether, you know, say 65% of people believe this and only 22% of people believe that. Rather, they're trying to understand why people believe the things they do. What are the underlying psychological mechanisms that lead people to believe in the way they do? But in many cases, the reason why people are interested in understanding that isn't just for its own sake, just to understand facts about the human mind, but because if we understand the mechanisms, 
if we understand why people believe the things they do, we'll have some better insight into whether we should trust the intuitions that we have about these kind of cases. So, for example, if you find yourself feeling this deep sense that there's something more to, to in this universe than just us, there's also a God, then you might ask, why do I have that sense? What is it that makes me have that intuition? And depending on what you learned, why it is that you believe that, you might believe more and more or less that that's an intuition you should trust, that you should put your faith in. In much the same way, each of these other kinds of issues that philosophers have dealt with is an issue in which people find themselves having strong intuitions, often conflicting intuitions, pulling them in different directions. And the better you understand why you have those intuitions, the more you should understand whether you should trust them, whether you should put your faith in them, or whether you should just dismiss them. Uh, so even a philosopher who is interested in uh, answering the question of, say, a particular, whether a particular action is permissible or not, or indeed the question of whether John knows that it's 5 p.m., mm -hmm. Such a philosopher might still be interested in the results of experimental philosophy because it's a way of isolating certain factors that might distort our judgments, that might lead us away from the truth of the matter. You've got it exactly right. I think a really important thing to notice is that philosophers don't usually think about questions in which it strikes us that the answer is obvious. Instead, philosophers usually think about questions in which we feel, as it were, pulled in different directions. So, a typical kind of question that a philosopher might think about is, say, the question of free will, where there's something really drawing us to the idea that human beings have free will, but something also drawing us to the opposite kind of conclusion somehow seems like maybe everything is determined. But clearly, there are these opposing forces within us. And now we might ask ourselves, so which of those opposing forces should we believe? And if we have a better sense of what it is that's pulling us in the one way, what it is that's pulling us in the other way, we have a better understanding of which one we should be putting our faith in. Now, one might argue that in general, practitioners in a particular domain have a special sense of that domain, of a particular insight into it, and philosophy may be a particular instantiation of that. Philosophers, through their training, through long hours of consideration, through having the skill to make certain distinctions, may perhaps be able, one might argue, to give more accurate, more reliable judgments in the face of certain scenarios than people without philosophical training. Indeed, many people criticize the experimental philosophy movement on the grounds that it tries to substitute the judgments of the masses, as you were, for the judgment of the philosopher. How would you respond to that criticism? Well, I think it's a very legitimate question whether um, ordinary people are making certain kinds of errors that we can avoid by engaging in serious philosophical training. But I don't think it's at all right to think that experimental philosophy is opposed to that, so that it's in some sense an objection to experimental philosophy. What experimental philosophy says is just that if we want to know whether something like that is true, we shouldn't figure it out by just sitting in our armchairs and thinking, you know, does it seem to us that trained philosophers are avoiding certain errors that ordinary folks make? The way we should figure it out is by doing experiments. In this case, doing experiments that compare the intuitions of ordinary people to those of philosophers. And in fact, there have been a whole series of different experiments conducted by experimental philosophers that do just that, that actually ask whether ordinary people think about these things differently from the way that, say, philosophy professors do. The results have often been very surprising. And do you think there's any way of answering the question in that case who wins, as it were, especially if our goal is not to understand mechanism, but rather to aim at truth? You know, in, it's always going to be a difficult question once we understand a given mechanism, whether we should think that that mechanism is one that's reliable or one that's not reliable. Of course, it will be much easier to know if we successfully can understand that mechanism than if we can't. But the main result that's actually come out of the majority of studies comparing philosophers to non-philosophers is this, that the judgments of the philosophers about particular cases are shockingly similar to the judgments of the non-philosophers. Mm -hmm. The difference between the philosophers and the non-philosophers seems to lie more in their ability to construct a theory that explains the whole pattern of different cases. So a case in which that sort of pattern comes out really clearly is in a beautiful study by Schwitzgebel and Cushman. So what they did was they presented participants with a series of cases and what they did then was just to vary the order in which the cases appeared. So you're either getting case A, then B, then C, or C, then B, then A. And then after you've received all the cases, then you're asked this further question, what do you think about this following kind of general principle? So if you look at the judgments of the ordinary folks, 
what you find is this interesting effect where, depending on the order in which the cases were received, they give different judgments about the individual cases. But then, when they're asked about the general principle, they fail to see the connection between the general principle and the individual cases. So the change in the order has no impact on the judgments about the general principle. They just give the same answer about the general principle regardless of what the original order was. But then, Schwitz, Gable, and Cushman decided to do things in a slightly different way. They took this exact same experiment and then ran it on philosophy professors like ourselves. So philosophy professors receive these cases in different order, and just like the ordinary folks, they just give a different answer depending on whether it's A, B, C, or C, B, A. So depending on just the order in which they're asked the questions, they're giving different answers. But now they do something different. When you ask them about the general principle, what they do is that they come up with whatever general principle will justify the answers they just gave. So unlike the ordinary people, they will change their view about which general principle is right, depending on whether they got the original cases in one order versus in the other one. Wow. So in this way, non-philosophers were actually more consistent, you might say, in their judgments. Maybe not consistent between the general principle and the individual cases, wow. but consistent in their adherence to the general principle. Yeah, exactly. So their, general, their view about the general principle was not affected by this manipulation. So on one hand, you could say that philosophers are, are more uh, showing a special kind of sophistication in that at least they're not being inconsistent between their principles and the individual cases. But in, on, at the same time, you might think, that that very inconsistency that the folk are showing is allowing them to escape a certain kind of error. Mm -hmm. In giving this one example, though, I didn't at all mean to suggest that the question is closed. The question is to whether we should be looking at the intuitions of philosophers versus ordinary people. What I mean to suggest is that the right way of answering that question isn't to think about it from the armchair, it's to do mm -hmm. experimental studies on philosophers versus ordinary people. Do you think there's any way of delineating a characteristic set, say, of questions that philosophers tend to be interested in that are specific to philosophy and not shared broadly by other disciplines? You know, it's a really interesting question. It's very hard to say of all the different kinds of questions that philosophers address, which are sort of the characteristically philosophical ones. It seems like there's this certain sense that as you keep questioning something and questioning and questioning, regardless of what you started out with, you're eventually going to end up with kind of philosophical questions. Mm -hmm. So say you start out with just a question in marine biology. Then you ask, you know, but why do you think that? And why do you think that? Why do you think that? Then eventually you're going to start end up with questions in, as it were, the philosophy of science. Mm -hmm. Or suppose you just started out with a perfectly ordinary question about our government's policies. Mm -hmm. You know, what do you think the government should do in this situation? But why do you think that? And why do you think that? Eventually, maybe you'll end up with questions that we think of as being not political questions, but questions in political philosophy. So it seems like what these experimental studies that experimental philosophers are aiming at doing is not so much addressing just the individual questions about the nature of some certain aspect of people's minds, but addressing the questions that have this kind of character of fundamentality or ultimacy, questions that are sort of lie at the basis of all the other kinds of questions we might be asking. Now, sometimes when I hear people discussing experimental philosophy, they might seize on some particular experiment and mm -hmm. say that it was poorly conducted. And they might be correct to suppose that it's poorly conducted. And very often people draw the conclusion from this that philosophers just don't have the training to perform experiments, don't have the training to statistically analyze the results and so on and so forth. Do you think this is a fair criticism of experimental philosophy? Well, a lot of times when people pick out a particular experiment and say that it was poorly conducted, they're right. And that experiment that they're picking out really was poorly conducted. Mm -hmm. But in much the same way, if people tried to uh, talk about moral philosophy and they said, you know, sometimes people working on que moral questions come up with terrible arguments and make, say things that make no sense at all. So for that reason, it seems like philosophers just really aren't equipped to, the, to talk about morality. They should just give up on it. That would be, we would ins recognize instantly that that's a mistake. Of course, sometimes philosophers say terrible things about morality, but that doesn't mean there's something about being a philosopher that you can't talk about it. Mm -hmm. And I think much the same thing is going on in the world of experimental philosophy. As you look at the trajectory over time, you see that more and more experimental philosophy papers are being published in the top journals of psychology or cognitive science. Clearly, these papers are succeeding by ordinary psychological standards. And then, of course, there are going to be some bad apples. So are there any other misconstruals or mischaracterizations of experimental philosophy that you think need to be addressed? Yeah, you know, I think there's one way in which a lot of people really are misconstruing what experimental philosophy is about. So they see these people using this radically different method 
they've been accustomed to just thinking about these questions sort of in a more a priori way. They see these people going out and doing experiments, doing something very unlike what they did traditionally. And then somehow they think, because people are using this very different method, they must hate the old method and kind of reject that entirely. But I don't think that's true at all. If you see that someone, for example, is playing classical music in an orchestra, you wouldn't immediately infer, well, they must hate hip hop or <laughs> folk or rock music. Maybe a given person could just happen to be engaged in playing one type of music, but also really appreciate many other types of music. In much the same way, experimental philosophers themselves are philosophizing by conducting experiments. But that doesn't by any means mean that they reject other forms of philosophical inquiry. In fact, many, most experimental philosophers seem deeply appreciative of all these other forms of experimental inquiry, of philosophical inquiry that are radically different from the one they're actually engaged in. So, on a more personal note, how did you come to do experimental philosophy? As I recall, there really was not such a thing at the time that you started doing it, and your training was very much as a philosopher. So how did you come to, first of all, adopt the methodology, and how did you come to uh, train yourself to be able to perform it successfully? Well, it's more a question of how I went from empirical work into philosophy. Mm -hmm. So when I was um, an undergraduate, mm -hmm. I was doing empirical work in collaboration with someone who was a graduate student at that time, his name was Bertram Muller, and then we continued doing empirical research after I graduated, mm -hmm. so then he was um, a professor, I just had various kinds of odd jobs, but I was still doing work with him. We published a whole series of papers, I just saw them as papers in psychology journals that were sort of outside of philosophy, and then at some point I kind of had a crisis of conscience and I said, I'm going to leave this world, I'm going to go into mm -hmm. philosophy. So I went into philosophy thinking I was going to be doing something radically different. But then something a little bit surprising happened. So uh, some, a philosophy professor, his name was Alfred Mealy, read one of these papers that we had just published in a psychology journal and just seen as a psychology paper. And he decided to treat this paper kind of as though it was making a contribution to philosophy. So he thought, you know, well, some of these things are right, some are wrong. But you can see this paper as addressing a philosophical question. And I had really never seen it in that way until he thought of that. But then, after I looked at his criticism, I noticed something puzzling. So he was saying that we were um, right about some things and wrong about others. But then when I looked at one of the things that he was saying we were right about, I just kept thinking, that can't be right. Now that he's articulated it so clearly, it must be wrong. So I'm going to show that it's wrong. But then when I show that it's wrong, I'm going to try to publish it in a philosophy journal. I'm going to try to take it seriously in the way that he was as philosophy and not as this sort of distinct discipline. And what advice would you give to a graduate student, say, whose background, unlike yours, at the undergraduate level, is in philosophy, and who, say, is now embarking on a graduate career in philosophy, but who would like to have as her particular focus experimental philosophy? You know, I think, I think there are sort of two pieces of advice that come to mind. One is that a really important aspect of just doing intellectual work more generally, but one that I think is sometimes discouraged in philosophy, is collaboration. So instead of thinking of yourself as this kind of lonely genius who's going to go off and just discover something by herself, you should think of yourself as embedded in this larger intellectual community. You should try to work with others. So many of the greatest um, experimental philosophy papers, including so much of your own experimental work, is conducted in close collaboration with others, in particular with, in close collaboration with people in, from other disciplines. So I feel like the idea of trying to work together, trying to work together with other people to kind of converge on, on a solution is really important. Then the second one is just a piece of advice about the sort of more instrumental part of um, your graduate career. So on one hand, people feel like they're trying to find the truth about certain kinds of questions, but at the same time, people always have this worry about succeeding, for example, getting a job, getting published, and so forth. And I've seen a lot of people try various strategies in order to maximize their chances, say, of actually successfully getting a job, of getting published, and so forth. But my sense about that is that that phenomenon is just completely unpredictable. If you try to match the, today's fashions, then the fashions change. Suddenly the thing you are working on is like out of the fashion. What you should do instead, I would suggest, is just to give up on that whole attempt. Mm -hmm. The whole attempt to kind of fit with whatever would make you successful. There's, it's of course very important to succeed career-wise, but there's little hope you can predict what will make you succeed career-wise. So I think the most important thing to do is just work on something that you really care about, something you really believe in. Maybe it will turn out to be successful in a career sense, maybe it won't. 
But if it doesn't, at least you worked on something that was close to your heart, something you really felt passionate about. I couldn't agree more with that advice. So do you have any final thoughts in closing on this discussion? Well, you know, I just think one thing is so far we've just been talking so much about my own work, but I worry that maybe that's been some neglect of so many of the other people who have done really important work in experimental philosophy. People like Sean Nichols, Edouard Mashri, Stephen Stitch. And I feel like if you really want to get a sense of what experimental philosophy is all about, it shouldn't be just so much by looking at the work of any one figure, but by looking at all of these different people coming up with all different things, especially in these days, all of the really junior people, people who are just, say, in their first years of graduate school, doing amazing things that are sort of moving the field in different directions. Philosophy is an ever-changing enterprise, and as we've heard today, there's a movement to foot that has seen philosophers leave those armchairs and head out into laboratories to conduct empirical research. We heard today from one of the pioneers of this movement, Professor Joshua Nob. Professor Nob, thank you so much for joining us on Philosophical Conversations. It's been a real pleasure having you here. It was a terrific conversation. Thanks so much for being here.